So the events in March 2020 highlighted for us some structural vulnerabilities in money market funds stemming from uh, their liquidity mismatches, their use as a cash management vehicle, uh, as well as uh, the relationship uh, with certain regulations and, and the structure of the markets in which they invest. As I mentioned, we, the FSB published a consultation report at the end of June, and Hune in just a moment is going to give a couple introductory points uh, of the report before we kick off our discussion. And when the working group prepares the final report, it's certainly going to take into account the feedback received both today as well as in written responses that I encourage all of you to submit. And I'll just note that there's an August 16 deadline for those submissions. So our purpose today is, is not to spend too much time on the, the consultation report that we've put out. We hope everyone has read that. It's really to hear back from you. So even though we're going to start out with a brief overview, we're going to do that only briefly so that we maximize our time for discussion. So today we're going to focus on two topics from the report. First, our proposals to money market fund resilience and assessment of those options in the consultation report. And then the second is considerations in selecting policy options, both in terms of those that should be taken into account when selecting specific policy options, as well as whether there are appropriate combinations that we should be keeping in mind. In each session, we've asked a few speakers to give some introductory kickoff remarks, but I should stress that this is really meant to be an interactive discussion. We expect those will be brief, um, and we expect that where there are questions, that it's going to be really free form from there on out. We uh, really encourage people to actively participate in, the, in this discussion. Hopefully, many of you are familiar at this point with the raise hand button in WebEx. If not, uh, please email the host, Dominique, and ask for assistance and ask that people use that. That's how we're going to recognize people to speak. And then we also encourage people not just to raise their hand when they speak, but then to unraise it, put it down when they're done so that we know we've called on you and can move on to the next person. Uh, we will try and give as many people as we can an opportunity to speak. Um, so again, uh, please make sure you, you make your comments brief so that others can all make sure that they are able to get in their responses as well. I'll note that we are recording the event today and we may publish it on the FSB's website. So, uh, with that, uh, I guess one last remark that I feel like goes without saying, but we all forget this even this long in, is to unmute yourself when you're speaking and then mute yourself when you are finished. So with that, I will hand it over to uh, Hume to go over these slides that we've sent out to all of you. Thank you, Sarah, good morning. Um, and greetings, everyone. <clears throat> Let me add my welcome to uh, to those of Sarah for um, uh, to all of you for for joining us. I'm I'm Hyun Song Shin. I'm the BIS Economic Advisor and the Head of Research. Um, and I had the pleasure uh, of um, of working with uh, Sarah on uh, uh, um, on this um, on this particular exercise. Um, Dominic, maybe we can go straight to um, slide two. Uh, so, uh, as Sarah said, this this consultation report um, uh, is is part of a uh, of a broader work program of the FSB uh, on non bank financial intermediation, um, and uh, it's also intended to inform uh, the policy recommendations um, uh, that uh, uh, were previously issued by IOSCO, uh, and uh, um, to. Uh, to inform any jurisdiction specific reforms that might uh, be deemed necessary uh, in the light of uh, in the light of the events uh, last year. Um, Dominique, can we next slide? But the first thing to note is that money market funds are not uh, a homogeneous. Um, uh, uh, you know, it's not homogeneous across uh, across jurisdictions. Um, at the end of uh, 2020, uh, the worldwide assets under management uh, in money market funds totaled 
almost $9 trillion, um, as you see in the left-hand panel here, $8.8 .8 trillion. Uh, the U.S. is uh, by far the largest market with $4.8 trillion, uh, followed by China. Uh, and then uh, you also see that uh, uh, some, Euro uh, some European jurisdictions are also quite large, Ireland, France, and Luxembourg, uh, in that order. Uh, but uh, uh, there are some, some differences, uh, clearly, because in the U.S., uh, government MMFs, which invest uh, uh, in sovereign and other government securities and repos backed by them, account for most of the sector's as, uh, as a under management. In, other, in, other, in the other jurisdictions, the non-government funds are, uh, are more prevalent. Um, one issue that uh, uh, I'll come back to again shortly is that uh, money market funds are usually denominated in local currency, um, but uh, the exception is in Europe, where um, dollar-denominated funds account for around uh, one third of the total assets under management, and uh, it's, it, uh, this underscores the importance of money market funds as a dollar funding vehicle for the banking sector. Um, and uh, this uh, uh, feature bears on the potential policy options, um, as we'll see later. Next slide, please. So just to give you a sense of uh, the, the issues that come up, um, this is a flow chart that uh, uh, is in the report. Uh, you should read this as um, uh, the funds um, originating on the right-hand side. Um, so the, uh, the investors are on the right-hand side of this chart. Uh, the ultimate borrowers are on the left-hand side. Uh, the money market funds are in that uh, dotted line box um, in, the, uh, in the middle. Um, they, uh, and I think what this chart shows is that, uh, um, they are important providers, for, uh, they are important providers of short term funding. For, um, for both, uh, financial institutions, um, especially dollar funding for banks headquartered outside the US, uh, but also, uh, non financial corporates and, and governments. Um, the other aspect that you see uh, on the right hand side is that they're also used by retail and institutional investors um, as um, uh, as cash management vehicles. Um, and while MMFs invest mostly in short term debt instruments, um, the shares are redeemable on demand uh, and many investors tend to treat um, uh, MMFs as cash like. Uh, in terms of the assets, uh, non-public debt MMFs are particularly active in the commercial paper market, uh, but also in the negotiable uh, certificates of deposits <laughs> market and also in repos. Um, and one feature that we describe in the report is that the secondary markets for CPs and CDs are generally not uh, um, uh, very liquid. Um, um, as investors, including MMFs, tend to buy and hold these instruments uh, to maturity. Next slide, uh, please, Dominique. So money market funds are subject to two broad types of vulnerabilities that uh, can be mutually reinforcing. Um, they're susceptible to sudden and uh, disruptive redemptions. Uh, and we saw that uh, last March as well as um, during the, uh, the great financial crisis of 2008. And they may sell challenges in selling assets, particularly under stress conditions. Um, first type of vulnerability arises from the fact that uh, MMFs um, engage in liquidity transformation uh, and are used for cash management by investors uh, and in some cases are exposed to credit risk. And in addition, regulatory thresholds for some MMFs may cause investors to, uh, to redeem preemptively to uh, avoid consequences for a fund crossing uh, some of these thresholds, so-called cliff effects. Uh, while certain types of investors, notably institutional investors, may may amplify uh, may amplify these redemption risks. So, uh, taken together, what these features mean is that uh, there is something of a first mover advantage for redeeming investors um, during a stress uh, event, and thus make individual MMFs or the or the uh, the MMF sector itself uh, susceptible to to run like uh, episodes. The second type of vulnerability um, arises because the MMFs hold um, financial instruments that have limited liquidity, even under normal market conditions. Um, and of course, in, in practice, these two types of vulnerabilities um, have been much more prominent in the non-public uh, non debt MMFs, um, the prime MMFs um, in, 
in the US terminology. I wonder, Dominic, whether we can move to the next slide. Yes. So uh, some features of MMFs and their uses uh, could also give rise to systemic vulnerabilities. And what this slide shows um, uh, is a comparison uh, of the 2008 episode uh, with the episode uh, last year. And uh, uh, it uh, gives you a sense of the, uh, of the redemptions that we saw um, uh, classified according to different types of money market funds. Um, and given the role of MMFs as funding vehicles for the, uh, for the banking sector, uh, and given the interconnections between the banking sector uh, and the rest of the financial system, that means that this type of redemption episode can uh, mean that uh, shocks um, uh, that are generated by these redemptions are propagated uh, you know, more broadly. Um, and uh, you can see that there are some differences uh, between uh, the types of uh, MMFs here. Um, in general, the government um, debt MMFs saw inflows, while the non-government debt MMFs saw outflows. And uh, uh, it was particularly the case, uh, it was particularly notable, for example, that the US dollar denominated funds um, domiciled in Europe uh, saw, saw, these large, uh, saw the largest redemptions. Let's move to the uh, next slide, Dominic. So what we do is um, uh, we uh, we consider a wide range of uh, policy options to address these vulnerabilities, and uh, we examine how uh, the policy options would affect the behavior of the investors, uh, the fund managers, and the sponsors, um, uh, as well as how these policy options might uh, impact uh, the broader short-term funding markets. Um, and uh, we give some weight to potential substitutes for MMFs and how the structure of the market itself uh, might be impacted. Uh, what we do is, um, Dominic, next slide. We, we group the, uh, the policy options according to the main mechanisms um, that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, we think might be important in, in the taxonomy. And you can see from this slide, and the details are in the report, um, I will not go through these options individually in, in any great detail. Um, but in this table, which is taken from the report, um, the color coding gives you a sense of the, the, um, the intended mechanism through which um, uh, we could achieve greater resilience. Um, and uh, so just to give you the heading, so the, uh, we classify the options according to seven so-called representative options. Um, so here they're swing pricing, uh, minimum balance at risk, the capital buffer, removal of ties between regulatory thresholds and imposition of gates and fees, uh, removal of stable NAVs. And then the last uh, two uh, have to do with uh, some limits on the eligible assets of the funds and uh, also the uh, some additional liquidity requirements that um, could kick in as part of an escalation procedure uh, and uh, there are options uh, uh, um, uh, there are some some variations of uh, um, uh, the same philosophy, but to uh, have uh, slightly different ways of operation. Dominique, next slide. Uh, a, um, uh, a set of uh, questions that we uh, that we apply to each of these policy options. Uh, we describe the the option itself, what uh, it intends to do. Uh, and then we look at the impact on the investor behavior, um, as well as um, uh, on fund managers and sponsors. Uh, I understand that my connection is a bit wavy. Uh, I hope you can still, oh dear, okay. Um, well, let, let me just carry on. I, uh, I'm not sure we can fix that midstream. Uh, and then look at the broader impact on the stability and functioning of the short-term funding markets. 
Um, Dominic, next slide. So uh, let me try turning off my video to see if that can save some bandwidth. So excuse my, uh, I hope that might be a little bit better. Um, so um, what we also described in the report is that the policies aimed at enhancing the resilience could be accompanied by uh, some additional reforms in two particular areas. Uh, the first involves policies such as stress testing and transparency requirements on short term funding markets. And, uh, um, uh, and while they won't directly address the MMF vulnerabilities, um, uh, we might imagine that such policies could support uh, robust risk management by fund managers and risk monitoring uh, by the authorities. The second area uh, involves measures that aim at improving the, the functioning of the underlying short term funding markets. Um, and as I said earlier, the structure of the CP and CD markets make them susceptible to, to illiquidity, especially in times of stress. Um, and, uh, and this highlights the need for policy reforms to uh, enhance uh, MMF's own resilience, um, uh, as those uh, funds cannot rely on liquidity in these markets. At the same time, even in jurisdictions where the MMFs are, are large investors in CPs and CDs, um, MMF reforms by themselves uh, will likely not solve the structural fragilities in the short term funding market. And so this is why uh, we've put uh, quite a bit of stress on uh, the broader context of the functioning of, uh, of the CP and CD markets, um, as you'll see in the, in the report. Dominic, next slide. So, um, uh, as we'll see later, th there are two sets of considerations, and this is really the heart of the consultation process, uh, and we would be particularly interested in your views on, on these questions. Um, the first is about how to prioritize specific options in the context of uh, the identified vulnerabilities. And uh, clearly, the important factors to consider will be existing regulations, the size and the structure of the money market fund sector, in, it, uh, in the particular jurisdiction um, and the particular use of MMFs by different types of investors and borrowers. Um, uh, and these factors will, will affect the need for, um, and these factors will, will dictate the, the need to tailor the uh, reforms to particular jurisdictions. And in this context, the currency denomination and the impact on um, bank funding markets will also be, uh, be an important consideration. Now, um, a single policy option on its own may not, uh, may not address all the vulnerabilities. And so uh, the second set of considerations is how authorities can combine the options to address um, uh, all the uh, MMF vulnerabilities prevalent in that jurisdiction. So a natural starting point here is to consider tools that authorities um, uh, and the funds themselves have at their disposal, but have not uh, uh, used in practice. Uh, and in terms of new policies, certain measures may be straightforward to implement and uh, broadly compatible with all the options, while others may be incompatible. And so another possible consideration would be the, uh, um, so um, irrespective of the direction of the change, uh, authorities will need to ensure that the selected combination of the options is coherent in its objectives. Um, um, uh, and um, and uh, uh, there is a uh, quite a bit of emphasis in the report on um, combinations of uh, uh, of options that uh, that may uh, help the authorities to uh, enhance uh, to 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 enhance resilience either to make uh, money market funds more cash like or, or go to the other end of the spectrum and make them uh, more investment like. Um, and that clearly, that choice uh, clearly will depend on the on the role of the uh, of these money market funds in the respective jurisdictions. Dominique, can we go to the next slide? So, um, as Sarah said, uh, we uh, um, we have now published the the report. Um, we would be very grateful for your uh, for your uh, feedback by the sixteenth of August. Um, and the idea is to uh, revise um, the report um, in the light of the, uh, the feedback. And we uh, have the report slated to be delivered to the G20 um, uh, by, the, by the summit um, in October. So with that brief introduction, let me um, move 
to the next uh, session and uh, uh, and give the floor to Antoine Bouveret and Patrick McCabe, Antoine Bouveret from ESMA, Patrick McCabe from the Federal Reserve um, for the session uh, on the proposals to enhance MMF resilience. So Antoine and Patrick, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Yun, and thanks, Sarah. Good morning, uh, afternoon, evening to you all. Um, so, as Yun said, now it's the time to move to the policy option to address the MMF vulnerabilities described in the report. So, the list of policy options, along with the assessment of those options. Uh, as we already mentioned, those policy options have been categorized according to the mechanisms through which they aim to mitigate the identified uh, vulnerabilities in MMF. And when we come to the assessment, we actually look at different angles. What would be the impact on the behavior of MMF investors, managers, and sponsors, but also um, in the broader system, the implication for underlying market, financial stability, and potential impact on the substitute or uh, alternatives. So in that context, uh, we'll ask a few participants to uh, lead up the discussion. Uh, Kevin Gaffney from Fidelity, uh, Professor David Sharpstein from Harvard Business School, and John uh, Slipkenny from State Street, I've kind of agreed uh, to give introductory remarks. So we'd like to ask each of them uh, to give us two, three minutes to give their views on the policy proposal. And we could then uh, open the floor for discussion. So uh, Kevin, the floor is yours. Thank you. Great, thank you, Anton. And uh, thank you for having me here today. <clears throat> Just a quick disclaimer, uh, you know, I'm, I'm Kevin Gaffney at Fidelity Investments and I'm in responsible for our US money market fund. Fund. So, uh, my comments today are based solely on our uh, US business. Um, for decades, money market funds have been attractive investments due to their convenience, high credit quality, and liquidity. Money market funds are utilized by a broad spectrum of investors from small individuals to large institutional investors. Today, while many mar money market funds offer a relatively low yield in the current near zero interest rate environment, Investors have maintained their investments due to safety, flexibility, and liquidity that these funds provide. Money market funds constitute a critical component of the capital markets, allowing issuers to access low-cost funding under a well-defined regulatory framework. By investing in short-term instruments, money market funds serve as important providers of short-term funding to financial institutions, businesses, and governments. Although not acknowledged in the FSB report, there were large portions of money market funds that performed very well in an extremely volatile market that affected most financial assets from equities to treasuries in March of 2020. Public or government money market funds, which represent over 85% of the money market fund assets in the US, were recipients of significant inflows during both 2008 and 2020 and the underlying government assets in those funds remained liquid. These funds have shown resilience throughout periods of volatility and therefore do not require further reform. After the financial crisis of 2008, the SEC implemented a number of new regulations that strengthen the US money fund industry. These regulations improved transparency, risk management, and lowered both interest rate and credit risk. In addition, the regulations improve liquidity within money market portfolios by requiring that all money market funds maintain a minimum of 30% weekly liquid assets so that portfolios would be in a position to provide large amounts of liquidity without relying on secondary markets. But as the FSB consultation report points out, the potential imposition of fees and gates linked to this 30% threshold created a bright line in 2020 specifically in the institutional prime category, where institutional investors were concerned about access to liquidity. The fear of a redemption gate being applied negated the benefits such higher liquidity levels would have otherwise provided and likely accelerated the redemptions in institutional prime funds. In reviewing the options that the FSB report has outlined, we believe that those that are targeted at providing liquidity within money market portfolios would be most effective. Removing the ties between regulatory thresholds and imposition of fees and gates would likewise allow fund managers to access this large pool of liquidity to meet redemptions without the need to sell assets. We believe that delinking of fees and gates from the 30% weekly liquid threshold should be an essential part of any reforms, but acknowledge that the additional measures could also be implemented to further enhance the resilience of money market funds. 
Other options outlined in the report that should be considered are counter cyclical liquidity requirements, limits on eligible assets and changes to liquidity buffers based on its own fund characteristics. Calibrating liquidity buffers based on investor behavior should be an important consideration of any reforms. The FSB report also identified swing pricing as a potential option that could reduce the likelihood of destabilizing redemptions by imposing a cost on redeeming investors. Although swing pricing has been used in non-money market funds in Europe to some degree, use in money market funds would be extremely challenging due to the implementation issues surrounding same-day settlement and multiple daily NAV pricing. Similarly, determining a swing threshold in a liquidity product would also be a challenge, as these portfolios regularly can have large redemptions that incur no cost to the remaining investors. In our preliminary evaluations of determining a swing factor based on bid-ask spreads of money market securities during the 2020 episode, the results indicated that the factor would be de minimis and likely would not result in a swing price that would alter redemption behavior. We believe that the existence of swing pricing may be a deterrent to, to many investors, and as the report warns, an accelerant of preemptive redemptions for other investors. Thank you, and I look forward to this discussion. Uh, thank you so much, Kevin. Uh, in particular, I think you made a lot of interesting points, including on the, I guess, the need, I mean, the potential good benefits of having more liquidity in MMF, as well as the operational challenges uh, that might uh, appear for some of the options that we are considering. So, uh, thanks for that. Um, in that context, uh, David, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity here. Um, before I start, I just want to note that I'm speaking only for myself. I'm not representing the views of any organizations I'm affiliated with, including Harvard Business School, um, the National Bureau of Economic Research, or m and Bank, where I serve on the Board of Directors. Um, I want to commend the FSB for its excellent report. Um, the report describes the leading reform options, some of which are quite fundamental reforms, and discusses key benefits and considerations for each of them, being careful to consider the issues from a system-wide perspective. Now, the events of 2020 show that the reforms implemented after the 2008 run on money market funds did not meaningfully enhance the stability of prime money market funds. The core problem, uh, as noticed by Yun and in the report, is that prime money market funds, and I'm restricting my comments to the kind of the US space, uh, as did Kevin, um, use risky and illiquid assets to back liabilities, i.e. money market fund shares that investors take to be safe and liquid, and that they treat as cash-like instruments. It's been long understood that mismatches in safety and liquidity between assets and liabilities leave financial institutions vulnerable to runs that can threaten the stability of the broader financial system. And regulators use a combination of capital and liquidity requirements to reduce the financial stability risk posed by these mismatches at banks and other institutions. A similar approach can be used to regulate prime money market funds. In this two-pronged approach, prime money market funds would be required to hold some form of loss-absorbing capital and would be required to hold uh, a much larger share of their assets and truly liquid assets such as treasury bills. Properly calibrated, this approach can address two key objectives of money market fund regulation outlined in the FSB report, namely reducing the incentive to run, enhancing the ability of money market funds to withstand a run. Now, there are a number of ways to implement a capital regime for prime money market funds. One approach would be for prime money market funds to issue, issue a subordinated share class that would absorb losses before ordinary money market fund shareholders. In exchange for bearing these potential losses, the subordinated shareholders, longer term investors who are willing to bear losses, would be paid a premium over the yield uh, on the assets in the money market fund in normal times. Using standard risk models, my colleague Sam Hansen, Adi Sundaram, and I provide estimates of how big this share class would have to be to protect ordinary money market fund shareholders, and we estimate its likely cost. There are other ways to implement a loss-absorbing capital um, regime. Um, in all the options, money market fund uh, investors would be required to pay 
third private party uh, private entities or investors in advance for protection rather than getting it for free from government after the fact as happened both in 2008 and 2020. The second prong of the approach is to enhance the asset liquidity of prime money market funds. Like banks, liquidity should include high quality liquid assets, which for money market funds would consist of treasury bills, not short term financial CP and CDs. This approach might also imply that money market funds that have more run prone investors, for example, investors that move in and out of funds should be required to hold more liquidity. This is similar to the way that bank liquidity regulation is structured. And in this approach, we need to design ways to, um, for money market funds to actually uh, use the li liquidity buffer in times of stress. Now, some might object that the capital buffer and enhanced liquidity regulation would reduce the return to money market funds, thus reducing their appeal to investors and the ability of the sector to fund money market issuers and the sector might shrink as a result. And I agree that this could be a, a consequence, perhaps even a likely consequence, but it's also important to note that money market fund returns and the size of the sector, and here again, I'm talking about largely institutional prime funds, um, are likely um, inflated because money market funds and their investors have received government protection essentially for free. The experience of 2020 made clear that we need fundamental reform that enhances the resilience of money market funds. I think the FSB report puts us on the path of considering those fundamental reforms, and I look forward to hearing the perspectives of the other panelists and participants. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, David, for those remarks. Uh, in particular, as you said, uh, uh, I guess some work on improving the liquidity on the asset side, and as well, uh, I guess you suggest some reform on the liability side, including the, uh, on the capital requirements. Uh, uh, and so maybe uh, I could give the floor to our uh, third uh, panelists. So um, uh, please, John, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. So I'm John Slykonish. I'm the treasurer at State Street, and so I'll provide a perspective from a bank um, uh, and the bank's balance sheet as a participant in short-term funding markets. Uh, money market funds in their various forms around the world play a critical role in global cash and funding markets. Um, for that reason, uh, it's this goal of uh, looking for areas of improvement in policy and regulation that make the money market fund system more safe and resilient to liquidity sh uh, shocks is, is critically important. Um, our view as a, a large and global systemically important bank is that whatever changes are adopted should preserve the current role of both government and prime money market funds and, and their equivalents around the world, uh, ensuring that these fund structures, you know, particularly prime funds, uh, remain economically viable and available options to both cash investors and short-term issuers. And so I'll, I'll give two primary reasons. Um, the first is that banks do rely heavily on prime money market funds for our own short-term funding needs. Uh, these funds are the primary buyers of our wholesale CDs, which uh, we and other banks typically issue in you know, three to 12 month term. And these CDs are, are the most efficient and effective way to manage our own liquidity metrics like LCR, the, the liquidity coverage ratio in the event of a shortfall. Um, the LCR requires the funding of at least 30 days to, to be considered good liquidity. Uh, if prime funds were not viable or, or able to provide enough capacity, uh, banks would lose a significant tool to manage contingent liquidity in times of idiosyncratic stress or systemic stress. So this would make the banking system less resilient to liquidity sh uh, shocks or require banks to hold more liquidity ex ante which would be um, an economic drag, potentially reducing banks' ability to grow loans or make markets in, in, in those same times of stress. Um, just like in the corporate space where, where prime funds uh, are an important buyer of CP, um, there is a risk that uh, as these funding options are reduced, if that were to occur, um, you know, that paper would ultimately migrate outside of the regulated fund space, which could lead to other knock-on systemic risks. 
Um, so the second reason I'll give is that you know all money market funds, including Prime and, and their equivalents, are in, an important outlet for overnight cash investors as an alternative to bank balance sheet deposits. And so as, as we've all seen um, with the increase in global bank reserves due to monetary and fiscal policy stimulus since the onset of COVID-19, bank deposits have surged and caused uh, sharp reductions in bank leverage ratios. Um, so much so that even you know, last year there was temporary relief in the US on, on the supplementary leverage ratio. Anecdotally, we, we have heard several large banks talk about efforts to contain or reduce their on balance sheet deposits in order to manage leverage. Um, and so if uh, there were a more limited uh, set of viable uh, money market fund alternatives, um, banks who are already under pressure with uh, de the deposit surge on their balance sheets would potentially um, not have the capacity to absorb all of this additional cash. This could put uh, have other knock on effects on, on short term markets and then potentially compounding. This is that during periods of market stress or volatility, when we do see risk aversion or we see uh, liquidity hoarding, banks would be less and less willing to absorb these incremental surge deposits in the future. Um, so just to 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 summarize, um, you know, it's, it is critical that that we focus um, these efforts on. Uh, making the money market funds generally more resilient to liquidity shocks, um, but at the same time, preserving their the role that they currently play. Thank you. So thank you, uh, Kevin, uh, David, and John um, for your remarks. Um, I think in a way you have really teed up the challenge that we all face and the challenge that the writers of the FSB report had and that Money funds are clearly important to investors and to issuers. They have vulnerabilities in part because they offer liquidity without constraint to shareholders, uh, but hold some illiquid assets, at least some funds do. Uh, and that uh, reforms are needed to address these vulnerabilities, but the for reforms is, I think, um, as, as uh, Kevin pointed out, uh, some of them can be extremely challenging. So at this point, um, having, uh, I think, very nicely teed up the issues, um, we'd like to open up the floor for comments. For this session, we'd like to focus on the topics that were listed in uh, for the first session of um, the workshop in the agenda. Uh, the consultation reports description of, of money fund vulnerabilities, the reports policy proposals to enhance money fund resilience, uh, the reports assessment of those proposals, and uh, what you've just heard from the discussants. Uh, to uh, to make this work, we'd like to have uh, folks press the virtual hand symbol to the right-hand side of your WebEx screen if you'd like to comment. Um, and uh, I believe Dominique will help uh, me uh, uh, get a sense of the queue here. Uh, but at this point, the floor is open, and I'll wait a moment uh, for hands and then and for Dominique's queue. And um, let's get started. Dominique, I'm going to just begin uh, just to get things started. I see a hand immediately from Mark Carey, so I'm going to ask uh, Mark. Hello, everybody, and thank you for holding this helpful session. I am, uh, like others on the panel, I want to congratulate the FSB for producing a really good report. Uh, I think it's going to advance the discussion a lot. For this part of the conversation, I want to make two remarks. The first remark is uh, I agree completely with David uh, that it's important to make sure that the money fund sector bears the full social costs uh, of these funds for the financial system as a whole. Um, but if we look at the sector from a pure flow of funds perspective, it seems to me that part of the problem of size of the prime funds could be reduced by forcing the creation of a separate class of prime funds 
which can invest only in bank paper. John suggested that it's very important that there be uh, institutional funding of banks around the world, particularly in dollar terms. If you made bank only prime funds and other prime funds could not invest in bank paper, uh, then the banks would continue to have access uh, to dollar funding. Uh, and we know that banks around the world, either directly uh, if in their own currency or through the central bank swap lines to dollars, uh, have got access to backup funding through central bank facilities. Everybody else does not have access to that. However, everybody else in aggregate is a lot smaller than the banks. Okay, so if you can partition the problem of money market funds into the bank part, which is really not a problem under stress, uh, and everybody else, it may be possible to, you know, solve everybody else's problems in different ways than solving the bank's problem. My other remark is, uh, in reading the report, I urge you to be just slightly less genteel in the final report about giving national authorities scope to do nothing. Uh, you know, we very carefully say that conditions are different in different nations. That's absolutely true. But there is a concern in the long run about regulatory arbitrage across borders. Uh, and if some jurisdictions do nothing, then their money fund sector might, in the worst case, grow large and cause problems for the global financial system. So just a sentence here or there in the crucial places strongly suggesting that everybody who has a material volume of money funds do something about it, I think would be helpful. Thank you very much. And again, good job on the report. Thank you, Mark. And thank you for the specific recommendations. Um, you know, again, this forum is also to uh, prompt and well, to solicit, invite um, comments on the report. And those are due August 16th. So thank you. I'm going to turn next to Evangelos. Uh, I, I apologize for probably not get the uh, pronunciation right, but uh, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much. Actually, you got it exactly right. <laughs> uh, so, Angelos Benos from the University of Monaghan. I just uh, wanted to share a couple of quick thoughts uh, on the report, which, by the way, as uh, other people already mentioned, you know, it's, it's excellent and extremely informative. So, uh, by reading the report, it feels like the two types of externalities that we're dealing with. Uh, one is a Externality between mutual funds, uh, money market funds, I'm sorry, and the rest of the financial system, in other words, a systemic risk externality. And then there is um, a within uh, money market fund externality between different uh, stakeholders and investors. Uh, so, as far as the first one is concerned, the systemic risk externality, you know, I think one question uh, which might be relevant is whether we are interested in money market funds because they provide funding to banks. And only for that reason. Because the question then is, if that's the reason why we care about the money market funds, well, that's, you know, whatever happens to money market funds is going to be complementary to what we do with banks. Banks have been, you know, subject to liquidity and capital regulation. So the question is, what if banks are sufficiently robust to withstand any shocks from the money market funds? Uh, do, we, do we put our emphasis on banks or do we do that for money market funds? These two things are going to move in the same direction. Right, um, so that's one question. Unless, of course, you know, we care about money market funds because of the funding they provide to non-financial entities as well. I'm not sure about that. I don't know whether that's an issue or not. In which case, you know, of course, there's no debate that we should all fo we should focus on, on money market funds because that's where the problem arises in the first place. So that's, I think, one you know one question. I think that uh, somehow uh, it would be useful to try to get uh, you know to try to understand a little bit better. And the second, the second item about the within money market fund externalities, you know, where you have some uh, investors basically running for the exit before, you know, before everybody else. And uh, the, you know, a lot of the tools that were suggested, you know, the kind of the really intuitive. Um, I had some, uh, you know, certain thoughts about how they might be implemented. At least some of them, for instance, swing pricing in the case where you don't have an underlying secondary liquid market, for example, uh, in um, and certificate CDs and commercial paper. Uh, typically, if uh, if these were tradable securities, there was a secondary OTC market. Uh, you could uh, you know, 
you could go under the markets, you could sell the securities, and you could, you could see on the day of, that you would do the actual liquidation, you could measure what the costs of that liquidation would be, and then it would be easier to transfer the costs back to the uh, back to the investors who were redeeming uh, their, their shares. But if there's no underlying secondary market, the question is one challenge, I think, is how, how do you calculate this, um, you know, this, uh, 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 you know, how do you implement swing pricing? So I'm just going to have to pause here. Thank you very much again, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, Evangelos. Um, at this point, um, again, just working off the queue, I'm going to be turning to Richard Portis. Thank you, Patrick. Um, I'll try to be brief. Uh, I think one thing that hasn't been raised in this discussion so far is the impact on uh, the central banks in their role unwanted role as market makers of last resort uh, when things go wrong. And I was a little surprised to hear Kevin say um, uh, many market money funds were buying in March 2020 because underlying government bond markets were liquid. Oh, yes? Really? Uh, uh, I thought there, there were some problems in the Treasury's market, if I recall correctly. Um, and indeed, um, uh, the central banks did have to act, um, not just in the U.S. Um, and the second point that I'd like to make uh, is about, um, in a sense, the holy grail here. Uh, it's the same as the holy grail in Too Big to Fail. Um, and that is, how do you get uh, institutions, uh, funds, whatever, to pay for the moral hazard that they, uh, that they generate? Uh, and um, David said, uh, that uh, yes, if the money market funds had to pay ex ante for the kind of protection that we're talking about, that he was talking about, um, that would lower their returns, the sector would shrink, and maybe it's now inflated. Indeed, indeed, quite so. And I think that's something we have to take very much to heart that uh, in a world in which these institutions, in which the money market funds, really were paying fully for the costs that they might impose on the rest of the system, um, they might die. Their business model might become totally unviable. Uh, and um, I don't know whether David and his colleagues have investigated the costs um, and what the consequences would be for returns to the funds, but this is something I think we have to keep in mind. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Richard. Um, and you raised some fascinating questions that uh, we have discussed in the past um, about the, the cost of capital buffers, um, for example. Uh, but it's a broader question about externalities. Um, I want to, at this point, uh, turn to Michael. Um, and again, I probably don't have the pronunciation right, but Michael Paco. Yes, hello. Uh, Michael Paco from AXA Investment Managers. Um, I've gone through the report and uh, frankly, uh, a lot of, of aspects uh, have been analyzed. Uh, the impact of the crisis on money market funds, uh, what they call uh, the, the vulnerabilities. Still, I have two comments. One is uh, linked to what I would call uh, the elephant in the room. Uh, I think for uh, long action, very accommodative monetary policies uh, have not really been assessed, uh, what are the side effects, uh, asset price bubble, uh, impression that markets are liquid while they are not so liquid, uh, difficulty to assess market risk uh, for market funds, and frankly it was pretty difficult to, uh, to understand that uh, we would face a liquidity crisis, uh, especially in Europe when you, you see all this excess liquidity in the system, so uh, first point. And, and, and the other thing is, uh, is linked to the fact that uh, the, the CP market was the only market where central banks were not intervening. So the other markets, bit MBS, treasuries, ABS, uh, corporate bonds in Europe, uh, were uh, helped by, by the ECB intervention or by the Fed intervention. And maybe that's something to take into account because that's where uh, we had some uh, lack of liquidity. So CP market was illiquid, maybe because it took too much time 
uh, for central banks to, to join and, and to, uh, to intervene. So it was uh, my two comments. Thank you very much, Mikhail. Um, I believe Tom uh, Callahan has been waiting patiently. Uh, Tom, you have the floor. Excellent. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you uh, for holding this very, very thought-provoking panel. I wanted to also pick up on some of uh, Professor Sharfstein's comments regarding the need for prime funds to have uh, liquidity buffers or uh, or some sort of subordinated share class. I would just make the observation uh, that money funds were not the cause of the 2020 uh, crisis. This was a global systemic risk brought on, uh, brought on by, you know, an unprecedented pandemic. Uh, and it was not, as the point was just made, specific to money funds, even you know, the most liquid asset classes such as U.S. Treasuries uh, were really grinding to a halt. Uh, there were no investor losses, even in prime funds. There were no gates, there were no fees. And while certainly stressed, uh, I think the argument can be made that uh, prime funds weathered the crisis, certainly with uh, uh, the, the, the substantial help of central banks globally. But I think that could be said of a lot of asset classes. So I think just uh, singling out uh, money funds for these types of um, uh, reforms uh, may not be appropriate. Uh, Professor Sharfstein also said that money funds hold risky in a liquid assets, and, and and I would challenge that um, money fund assets are not risky if you look at historical default rates of things like uh, commercial paper, uh, but they are a liquid, and I think that gets to the bigger and frankly most important topic uh, that we should be thinking about here. Uh, the 2020 COVID crisis was a liquidity crisis, not a a credit crisis. Uh, markets simply. Uh, ceased to function regardless of the uh, credit quality of underlying assets. Uh, and, and that's a, a challenge uh, that will continue even if we head down the road of putting reforms into prime funds that have the effect of essentially uh, canceling the product. Uh, we will be right back in five or 10 or 25 years after the next crisis uh, wondering why uh, money funds, uh, money markets, excuse me, once again went into crisis uh, and required central bank support. The CP market simply doesn't function uh, in times of market crisis because it relies on bank balance sheet. Uh, we've seen time and time again that in times of crisis, banks close their balance sheet and so holders of CP can't sell. Uh, prime funds own less than 25% in the U.S. at least of outstanding CP. So that other three quarters uh, is held by investors that will face similar liquidity crises if we don't address the broader systemic issue of CP market structure reform. Uh, what we believe the answer to that question uh, is, is around uh, introduction, introduction of all-to-all -all platforms, introduction of standardization, transparency, so that we create a more robust, resilient secondary market for CP that can withstand these periods of acute systemic stress without the requirement of central bank support. Thank you very much. Tom, thank you. Um, we are at this point uh, 10 minutes away from the end of the session. So as I call on folks, uh, please try to keep your remarks as succinct as possible. Um, Tom, I think one thing that you've uh, teed up for us is, is again, this challenge. Um, money funds aren't the only, um, as it were, animals in this zoo, um, and the zoo has some structural issues. Um, one thing that we have, uh, I think this is, this you, you find that theme throughout the FSB report, um, the concerns about the short-term funding markets. But one thing we've struggled with is that money funds are offering essentially uh, liquidity without constraint to their investors while holding, as you put it, um, some assets that are less liquid. And and having giving managers some tools, uh, remember gates and fees were supposed to give managers tools to address that, didn't work. Um, and so the question I think, uh, you know, is is what tools would managers have for making the liquidity of fund shares more akin to that of uh, liquidity of, of the instruments that they hold. So that has been a challenge, uh, but you raised some important points. 
Uh, at this point, I, though, I'm going to uh, turn next. Uh, I believe it's um, Federico um, uh, Cupelli. And I, again, apologies for pronunciations here. Yes, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, and thank you again for this opportunity. Um, I'll be brief. Um, as the European Fund and Asset Management Association, uh, many of my members are on this call today. Uh, Tom just put it very nicely. Uh, I think that the report, at least from a preliminary look at it, uh, is a bit too one-sided in the sense that it fleshes out nicely all the options for the buy side. Uh, but uh, it does little in terms of uh, suggesting what possible changes can come uh, into the uh, market microstructure. So I think that that is certainly something that needs to be uh, considered going forward because we as the buy side do see that the root of the problem um, is really the functioning of the short term money markets. I would also take this opportunity to underline how different the European experience has been uh, if we compare the intervention of the Fed uh, versus that of the uh, PEP program put in place by the ECB. Um, there, I would, uh, well, I guess you all know this, but uh, we, as, as money market fund providers, were essentially cut out of that program entirely, uh, both in terms of, of, of asset class and, and in terms of currency denomination. So that is a very different uh, experience that really goes to show that um, in Europe, at least, uh, the, the structures that are regulated under the MMFR, the EU MMFR, uh, did not experience any stress, did experience stress, uh, apologies as I correct myself, but did not have to gate or impose fees on, on any of their investors. Finally, um, I think that um, as many of my members, the timing of this uh, consultation with its uh, prohibitive deadline is very unfortunate if, uh, if, if the FSB is looking for quality inputs. The consultation is very meaty. It, it makes uh, um, many interesting assumptions that would need to be looked at with more time. And unfortunately, coming at the end of the, uh, in the middle of the summer, uh, I don't think it, it is going to help much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Federico. Um, and next, I'm going to turn to Thierry. Uh, and and I, I apologize again. I, I can't pronounce your last name, but uh, I believe it's a Pilipanat. Or so. <laughs> Help me out. I'll forgive you. Thierry Filippana from Finance Watch. Thank, thank you, you very much. You. Uh, I'll be brief. Um, thank you so much for this very interesting report. If you allow me, I'd like to share a, and forgive me for that, almost slightly philosophical reflection, which will link into what you said a few minutes ago, Patrick. Reading the report, it struck me that effectively, we're trying to solve an impossible equation. We're trying to, to do what all financiers know is not possible to do, is to get that free lunch that we all know does not exist. What am I saying here? On the asset side of those funds, we have instruments that are not cash. On the liability side, we're telling holders, don't worry, it's cash-like. And effectively, Patrick, that's what you were saying a few minutes ago. And that, you know, once we, we are very, very conscious of this, we have to, I, I think the only possible policy solutions that will derive from that realization that once we say that, and box three of the report says it very well, box three of the, the FSB report, that dealers were not doing, you know, the crisis of March 2020, they were not willing to hold long credit positions on their balance sheet. Um, well, once you say that liquidity dried up because dealers were not willing to long credit positions at the balance sheet, why and how could money market fund hold those positions with, without impacting their net asset value. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm stating the obvious. I know we're we're all specialists around this table or around this pool, but uh, but we sometimes I feel we tend to forget um, the most fundamental principle. And if I think in European terms, that means that as we all know, we have VNAV, CNAV, and and um, LVNAV. Well, effectively, VNAV are the only ones that say, hey, look, this is not cash. This is the fund that invests in financial instruments that whose value can fluctuate according to their credit quality and most importantly, as, as Tom said earlier, um, to their liquidity. Uh, but as long as we don't recognize that, we will 
get into situations that are, in my view, impossible to solve. Very happy to discuss policy solutions. I don't know if this is the right time. Uh, we, you know, uh, you know, happy to talk about swing pricing and, and things like that. But perhaps we keep that for the second part of of uh, of the of uh, of the session. But I think we should really not forget this this fundamental point, which seems to be forgotten so often. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, at at this point, I, I'm going to, in the interest of time, very quickly turn to Paul Tucker. Can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Okay. Um, well, it's a very good thing that this report has been produced. So thank you very much for, for that. Um, I'm with those who have struck the tone that it's about 10 years too late. Um, but that it's a great relief that the events of March last year prompted its review. For what it's worth, I think it would be, in terms of a test of whether you're going to kind of adequately solve this problem, I think I would work backwards from um, if you do all or any of these things and you do them um, kind of comprehensively across the main jurisdictions, um, will, you have cr will you have crushed the probability that next time there is difficulty the state will come in and underpin money market funds. I think that's what you should work back from. I mean, to what extent um, should the money market fund industry remain part of a semi-socialist kind of financial services um, industry? And for that, more constructively, I think one of the key tests is will money market, uh, and this goes to something that Hyun um, kind of touched on in his presentation, Will investments in money market funds continue to be presented in in published um, accounts, management accounts, and, and marketing as safe, as cash? Because if they are, if municipal treasurers and corporate treasurers in the United States and their counterparts in Europe elsewhere continue to treat these things as cash, then if they are big when the music <laughs> pops, it is highly likely that the state will um, step in. And so I think that as well as um, making reforms, whatever reforms you choose um, for the money fund industry itself, I think you need to introduce reforms and get accounting bodies and others to introduce for reforms that, that um, bear on how investments in, um, in money fund units can be, can be presented. Um, and I think this will be and I, the final thing I'd say, if I may, is the, the industry is obviously um, agitated about this. It's kind of how could they not be? I mean, the problem with a kind of rather than having a general policy on shadow banking, having a case by case policy is by the site, by the time something is big enough to be um, systemically significant, it has great lobbying power. And, it, and, and of course, will exercise that lobbying power in a in a kind of potent Way. So this will go through Congress and the European Parliament and elsewhere. And I think the I think the official sector should not be put off by this. I think it is time for you to put this on the desks of elected representatives that if they choose not to push through the reforms, you have done everything that they can. And so the responsibility for, for taxpayers money being used to prop up um, this sector is their choice as elected representatives rather than your own timidity, which, have, which has been the cause up to now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, uh, very, um, uh, I, I, I think, uh, food for thought there. I want to turn the last um, uh, intervention at this point, uh, turn for the last intervention to uh, Alistair Sewell. And uh, Alistair, if you could be brief, uh, we're, we're right at the end of our t allotted time. Sure will be, Patrick, and thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, Alastair Sewell, Regional Head of Fund Ratings and Fitch Ratings for EMEA and Asia Pacific. Uh, I wanted to sound a note of caution on some of the proposals in relation to the investor base. Whenever we rate a money market fund, the, the investor base is an area of uh, intense focus for us. And our view is that one size does not fit all when it comes to the investor base. We have observed many different behaviours of different types of investors, and we think that rules based on large investor concentrations can, frankly, uh, be misleading depending on the type um, and the behaviour of the underlying investor. And we would even go so far as to say that some of the reforms introduced in China 
2016 and 2017, which were focused on the investor base, have stymied growth in the number of funds in China due to the challenges of investor concentration rules in the startup phase of a fund's life. So whilst we agree that investor behavior is a significant factor in the overall performance of money market funds, we would advise caution uh, on how rules implementing investor concentration are affected. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Alistair. So I think, it, it, Normally, a moderator would try to summarize some of the themes that came up in the discussion. Um, I think at this point, the themes are pretty similar to the ones that we teed up at the beginning, that money funds are important. Um, you can either look at that from a perspective of the $9 trillion worldwide industry. Uh, it provides an important economic function, or from Paul Tucker's perspective, that it also has a lot, lot of lobbying clout. Um, regardless, uh, that uh, combined with some vulnerabilities uh, raises some pretty important challenges, uh, not the least of which is that these things function very well almost all the time, and when they don't, it's exactly the wrong time. Um, so this has been a challenge for the FSB. Uh, we'll continue to wrestle with that. We look forward to your written comments by August 16th. Uh, but thank you very much to everyone who participated. My apologies to those who couldn't. Uh, as we, we our, our time is short here today, but again, if you could provide written comments, that would be very helpful. If you have your hand up at this point uh, and you'd like to speak in the second session, please uh, keep your hand up. Otherwise, if you could take your hand down, that would be very helpful. And at this point, I'll turn it back over to Hune and Sarah. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Patrick, and thank you to everyone who uh, contributed in the first session, so it's now time to move on to our second topic of discussion, which is how authorities should select the policies most appropriate in their, their jurisdictions, as well as how different policies could be combined to be most effective in addressing all relevant money market fund vulnerabilities prevalent in a jurisdiction. So we're interested in also hearing in this session about other complementary measures that could be considered uh, either for risk monitoring by authorities or also enhancing the overall resilience of the short-term funding markets and how those measures could interact with money market fund reform. So as with the last session, in this session, we have a few speakers uh, who will kick us off. And again, so that everybody has a chance to participate, we're hoping that you keep your remarks to two to three minutes. So I'm going to start off with John Donahue. Thank you. Um, so first, thanks to the FSB for having me uh, invited to make some comments on this very important topic. A lot of what uh, I was gonna mention has already been said, so I just wanna emphasize a few things. First off, I do think that um, when considering policy uh, changes to these products, there's still, there has to be a recognition or at least an agreement that there is a risk to any investment product. These are open-ended funds. Any open-ended fund is, uh, is relegated to a first mover advantage. These are investments that clients, at least institutional clients, invest their cash in. But I can assure you as somebody who was involved in the March 2020 uh, you know, event, they do not look at these as cash deposit products that are safe. They look them and, and, you know, I think something that is never mentioned, or at least I don't hear a lot of discussion about is at least in the US, they do have floating NADs, prime institutional money market funds, and clients are well aware of that. I think we've already talked about that 30% WLA and the bright line that it introduced and the, uh, the incentive for clients to move out first before there was a potential for a gate and or a fee, I think gates were clearly the concern for our clients. It's quite frustrating sometimes to have uh, gone through that event and uh, listened to some of the comments about how these funds don't have any liquidity, they were illiquid. That's not the case. In fact, there was plenty of liquidity in our products. We just were not able or willing to use it because to meet redemptions because of that uh, potential for a, uh, a fee and, and or a gate to come down. So in fact, we were forced to sell into a very illiquid market um, just exacerbating that situation, sitting there with liquidity that in any other product that portfolio manager would have, would have been able to use as a tool to meet uh, to meet redemptions. I do think that 
there has to be a recognition or at least an agreement again that the functionality and utility of these products are something that we want to keep and preserve um, for both the people that or institutions that invest in them as well as the function they bring to the market as it's been mentioned for uh, funding CP, Yankee CDs, municipalities in the US, one of the things that uh, doesn't get a lot of uh, discussion around uh, this, this group. And if that's the case, then I think you need to consider the complexities of some of the uh, and operational costs of some of the uh, proposals in the FSB um, report. Those uh, primarily being uh, minimum balances at risk. That was something that was looked at back in 2010 and after uh, the, the GFC. Uh, there was a 3% proposed proposal around the M MBR, and it just is not feasible. I can tell you right now, capital, the cost of capital relative to the yield um, that these products offer, it's, it's not feasible. Capital buffers will not work. That will destroy these products. No sponsor is going to do that. It's not feasible. Um, and by the way, if you do that, you're making them like a bank product, which is exactly what I keep hearing. We don't want clients to believe it is. So um, I just think that's something that um, has been considered. We have done a ton of work on that. It just doesn't work. And then you get into the whole point of having to consolidate assets of the largest players onto their balance sheet, particularly if you're bank owned as we are. Um, as far as jurisdiction, I think that there is a recognition that jurisdictions are different in the report. I think that's important. I think that, um, you know, we did see a difference in our euro and sterling that didn't have a government complement option <laughs> as opposed to the US, uh, which I think is something that, that, that's interesting and considering. Swing pricing doesn't work. Uh, I do think that there is an option or we have proposed something um, that would be uh, analogous to capital, however, it would be a redemption fee, uh, but it would be a modified redemption fee that would be a uh, very prescriptive uh, and, you know, clients would know about it and we are happy to discuss that in more detail, but it would be a, uh, you know, would be something that I think um, actually allows clients who want to pay for liquidity and our experiences, they do, uh, they are willing to do that in times of crisis to get to their cash. Um, and that capital then goes back into the fund to protect those shareholders that stay there. So I think that is a better way to think about how to get capital into the funds to protect the shareholders that are um, exposed to that first mover, uh, and, uh, you know, disadvantage um, at the expense of those that are willing to pay for the liquidity that they want at that time uh, through capital. I think the other thing just in, and Tom Callahan brings this up is, you know, there is a market structure issue here and make no mistake about it that when a bank or a broker dealer will not bid on a piece of one week high quality commercial paper or cd that is credit worthy that in uh you know everybody knows will pay par at maturity whether a money market fund is trying to sell it an ultra short fund is trying to sell it or an emerging market bond fund is trying to sell it if that's what they have their cash invested in will not bid on that that is a problem that's not a problem for a money from the money market fund that's a bigger problem for market structure and I do think that that's something that needs to be considered. All right, I will stop there. Great. Thank you, John, uh, for covering a wide range there. If I could turn next to Mikhail Prickle. Thank you, Sarah. We'll go through a few remarks. Uh, the first one, I've called it, uh, do not keep the messenger. Uh, money market fund should be seen as a canary in the coal mine and, and should not be designated as the ideal culprit each time there is a crisis. Uh, thanks to money market fund and the stress they can go through in, term of, in time of crisis, authorities have, uh, are informed quickly about market disruptions. Thanks to a well-organized cash management industry, well-identified investment vehicles, well identified fund managers, authorities have highly valuable interlocutors to talk to. Uh, reform that would substantially alter the features of MMF could uh, lead to a massive switch to substitutes and the risk would move to areas more difficult to understand and to predict. The current escalation process between money market fund and, co and authorities would be impaired and financial instability would certainly increase. My second remark is about uh, the precautionary principle. Uh, we should be careful not to go too far in our quest 
to try to address all the so-called uh, money market fund vulnerabilities. It will be a mistake to ask money market fund to operate on a daily basis as if they were in stress markets. It's not, it's not the case. This would be highly inefficient and detrimental to both investors and borrowers. We, should, we shouldn't find ourselves in a situation where indirect costs uh, of new measures outweigh by far the cost of what we don't want to avoid. My third remark is about the functioning of the underlying markets. It is absolutely key that investment funds can rely on the liquidity of the well, and the well functioning of the underlying market in which they operate. Policy reform should absolutely focus on the way to reduce the fragilities of these short-term markets. Uh, I'm talking here about transparency, pricing, reporting about the volumes, the transaction, uh, all the data that are needed to have some this transparency. It, it should be public data because so far, uh, I would say only Banque de France, uh, to what I know, is providing the, this free data. And do we, do we really think that even if we were able to make money market funds more resilient, they could operate normally or ex nihilo while the functioning of the underlying markets remain impaired? I don't think so. My fourth remark is about what we should take into account to select the most appropriate policy option. Uh, it is important to assess what is called in the report the intended function of money market funds in the jurisdiction they operate. Um, do we want them to be more cash-like or investment-like? I think the answer to this question will be a key driver to, to select the priorities. We should also take into consideration existing domestic specificities of money market funds. For example, why in France there is no public SINAV MMF? Why short-term money market funds represent only 15% of the total IUM of MMF? Uh, why uh, there is only public debt MMF in the US, uh, while half of the European money market funds are not invested in local currencies? I mean, uh, these questions have to be addressed. We should discuss very mo uh, more closely with our clients, I mean, to, to understand uh, what is their risk appetite, uh, their accounting treatment constraints, because there is a cash equivalent, uh, quite, uh, cash equivalent classification that, that is a, a big driver in, in their choices. Um, and, and we should also consider the type of borrowers we want to finance. Uh, is it governments or is it the private sector? as it will have a big implication for the real economy and not for just for money market funds. And my last point is about liquid assets. Um, we, we take for granted that instruments issued by government are always liquid, but we've seen in the past that is what not always the case. I'm talking here about Italian bonds, Greek bonds, or even US treasuries not so, so long ago. Uh, they had some difficulties, uh, difficult time, or at least uh, were less liquid than uh, as usual. So we, we should make sure that what we think is currently a strength uh, doesn't become a weakness. I'll stop here. Right. Thank you for those remarks and uh, given us a wide range from uh, potential unintended consequences to market structure thoughts to uh, money market funds themselves. So uh, hopefully we'll get to dive into many of those topics as we continue. Next, I'd like to ask Andrew Mitrick if he would come in. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you quite clearly. Great, great. Thanks very much. Uh, and thanks for inviting me to, the, uh, to this event. Uh, oh, really, most of my points have been mentioned. So I will stay under, I think, two minutes. Uh, in particular, I would like to echo what David Sharfstein and Paul Tucker said uh, earlier. I think there's just two themes that I would want to quickly mention about prioritizing and combining. The first is that uh, rules and regulations that come into effect only during stress times are going to tend to emphasize and be more pro-cyclical. They're going to amplify things that we had. So, so the gates and fees, for example, which were very well motivated, I think we did learn that 
in many ways, they're they're just going to make people act a little bit earlier. Uh, so so really, we want to have things that are not in place only during stress times because uh, sophisticated players will anticipate them. The second is that even though it's of course clear that money market mutual funds were not the driving force of what happened uh, in this crisis and 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 not a cause of uh, direct cause of any of the problems. I think it's quite clear they did receive the benefit of uh, ex post uh, insurance uh, uh, that that the government came in and central banks came in and were aggressive and 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 helped them uh, uh, in a way that they didn't have to pay for ex ante. And so in thinking about what our policy should be, I think we should first try to avoid things that are coming into place most strongly only during the crisis. And second, think about how to get some kind of reasonable uh, ex ante uh, payment in some form, uh, e either through the private sector or directly to the government for the insurance that they eventually get. And then we can have this kind of great industry, very, very useful industry uh, without uh, uh, the externalities that are not paid for. And that's it. Great, right. thank you, Andrew. Uh, very concise and to the point, so thank you for that. And uh, last of our kickoff speakers, if I could turn to Bob, please. Very much, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. That's great, thank you very much. I'm, I'm the only lawyer on a panel. It's the only time I've only been in, the only lawyer on any panel here, here, here in Washington. I am a former regulator. And I don't speak for any of my clients. Indeed, I expect to get phone calls later this afternoon explaining how much I don't uh, speak speak for them. But nonetheless, I I'm a former regulator and was around in the the uh, 2008 uh, 2008 crisis and do have some some thoughts of this. And thank you very much for inviting an old regulator uh, to, to to join you. You know, coming out of the crisis in 2008. Uh, the commission, the SEC here in the United States is what where my expertise lies. Uh, uh, enacted two reforms that were the, really the centerpiece of the U.S. response to the uh, uh, to the issues in money market funds. And, and one was the floating NAV uh, for institutional funds, which was a, a, a significant modification from existing uh, business model here in the United States. You know, it's 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 not clear what that floating NAV accomplished. It's not that it didn't accomplish anything. It's just simply not, in, in my mind, clear. The money market funds. The idea uh, was that uh, investors in money market funds would become risk takers, and this would not be a riskless asset. Uh, there is some debate uh, here among us on whether investors were uh, risk takers or were risk are not risk takers. Treated this as a form of currency or like a bank deposit. My experience is tends to be that they're there that that, that that did this not did not accomplish the, the goal uh, to treat them as risky assets. And it's coupled because they were they were they're muddled. One is at the same time the commission amended, I believe it was GAP, in order to say uh institutional investors continue to hold uh, floating rate assets as cash items on their balance sheet. Uh and secondly, uh they reinforced or reaffirmed the ability of funds to do bailouts. So, in one respect, the commission amended the rules to try to limit the moral hazard individuals treating these as guarantees. On the other hand, they either amended rules uh, and they or, or or reaffirmed rules that reinforced parts of the moral hazard. And to have re really done a, a study of whether you could go to a risk treat money market funds as a riskless asset, you really would have gone had you gone cold turkey in many aspects uh, that the SEC political system perhaps couldn't have sustained. At the time, if you recall at the commission, it was a three vote, three two, uh, a, a three two vote. But, um, the second thing is that uh, the fees and gates that were tied to um, financial liquidity of the funds, and, I, and, and then in some respect, uh, this is something those of you in the uh, in the group here who are social scientists or economists, this this was a, a an experiment uh, that was conducted on a grand scale. Uh, to see if easing gates would do what uh, the commission and European regulators uh, argue with that they would do is that that it would stop um, it, it would stop a run or impede a run and eventually or stop a run because of uh, investors would not or could not redeem. And we found out I think there's an answer. I mean, 
uh, uh, graduate papers are going to be written on this experiment coming out of uh, uh, we'll be reading for the next 10 years of how and why that didn't that didn't work one is that investors are are too smart that is they understood that the risk now was not the fund running out of liquidity the risk that it would hit the 30 percent threshold for uh, a fee or the 10 percent threshold for imposing a gate and then the assets would be locked up, which would impose terrible costs. Now, the fees didn't work to the extent because you know at the 30% test, the funds came in for relief and said, we, we can't hit the 30% as a matter of business. Um, the, I think one of the things that we learned or we understood or we should have understood is that a money market fund cannot impose a fee, uh, a liquidity fee, because it is a signal to the market to redeem and the signal that the fund is in trouble. And that means uh, it is widely believed within the industry and institutional investors that a fee will be shortly followed by a gate and money will be we locked up. And I think that we have to think about that. Those. Uh, uh, so what the fees and the gates really did accomplish in many respects, and although this wasn't the intention, I, I think it was the shift of, of assets in the market away from prime and to government funds because the government funds did not have the fees and gates. And so while I think the fees and gates have to be lifted, uh, the residual issue is the good things that the fees and the gates did, which is move assets from risky uh, prime assets with credit risk to government funds. How do you prevent that from, from being undone? So I think that's one thing that has to think about it. Um, some of the options, I am still, I still believe the hold back option that's being discussed has a great deal of merit. I think it needs to be sold. Uh, to regulators and to uh, policymakers and to the industry is differently. I think it needs to be sold as a form of essentially fund bankruptcy. Is what happens when nothing goes right uh, in the fund industry? You saw what happened with the reserve fund. Two years, people lock it up, money fighting over that money. One of the things the holdback does it acts as a form of bankruptcy and allocates the assets. And in some ways, like balances, has a clawback provision so that people who participated in the bankruptcy or in the run uh, um, um, bear greater the costs. That has the advantage of allocating the assets more fairly. It also has an advantage of discouraged participation um, in the run. But one of the things the March 30, the March 2020 taught us, and uh, none of the proposals uh, we were dealing with in 2010, 2014 area is what happens when uh, uh, liquidity uh, locks up and including liquidity in, in the government market. You know, the SEC or securities regulars do not have an answer for lack of, of liquidity. We cannot create liquidity. Uh, we can increase liquidity and there's some thoughts here and discussions worthwhile just having an, in a larger part of, uh, of the prime funds be in perhaps government securities. Um, but one of the criticisms from the banking world is the moral hazards been created by the industry itself in bailing out the funds repeatedly. I was surprised in, in March 2020 when the Fed came in and provided the liquidity program because now the Fed has come in and provided liquidity twice in a crisis. And in the same way that money market funds now believe moral hazard that the fund industry will bail them out. Um, the uh, money, money market fund investors probably believe that the Fed uh, will come in and provide liquidity the next time also, and they will invest accordingly. And I think Fed is in a difficult position, may need legislative help of, of thinking about whether um, the Fed ought to have some more uh, a liquidity program that doesn't go into place simply uh, at times of crisis is funded through some sort of fees on, on, on money market funds, but is basically in place. Uh, 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 that which is done on a sporadic basis in terms of crisis is, is, is a part of the system the same way um, it is, it is a, a part, part of banks. Uh, uh, and so there are a number of other uh, questions. I'm, I'm limited in time here and I, I look forward to hearing the discussion uh, as we go forward. Great, thank you Bob for sharing those thoughts. And now I'm gonna open up the floor to comments from the rest of our crowd here today. Again, please use the raise hands uh, feature uh, so that I know the order to call on you. I will try not to miss hands. Um, and then if I can just ask you to lower when you're done so I can keep track, but I'm gonna give a minute for folks to raise their hands.
Okay, I see uh, Eric Pan wants to come in as our first speaker. Go ahead, Eric. So, hi. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes. So, uh, well, first, thank you to the FSB for organizing the roundtable. It's really positive that they're doing a public roundtable um, on a very important topic. Um, I, you know, just a couple comments on, on this portion, and they kind of slip into what we covered in the first half as well. Um, I guess first, this notion of there was a bailout and that the existing reforms were not adequate. You know, I, I think we have to really look at this very carefully. And I know in this session, we're looking at policy options. And, and one reaction I had reading the report is how quickly the FSB kind of assumed you needed multiple policy reforms rather than considering whether or not um, the individual reforms on their own, how successful they would have been. So let me give you an example. Um, uh, something that uh, I think a lot of people have talked about is the removal of the tie between the 30% threshold and fees and gates. Now, um, you know, the ICI has has done work looking at, well, hypothetically, what would have happened if you had done that? So running a simulation uh, that if you didn't have that tie, it would it would show that most prime funds would have lasted another five weeks and still have maintained over 25% weekly liquid assets in the absence of that tie. And that shows a level of resilience that I don't think has been reflected in the analysis of the report, because um, the idea that um, you could have that length of time going on where you still actually had um, sufficient liquidity shows that the removal of the tie would have had a significant effect on its own to um, to 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 evade the need for any type of central bank support. And the simulation was assuming there was no MMLF. So again, to the comments of, 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 of others like um, uh, uh, Sir Paul Tucker and, and others, you know, uh, if we all agree that we want to avoid having um, central bank support, um, I think the evidence does show that we could have avoided uh, that possibility um, to a great extent. So I guess I, my, my first comment is, I don't really understand the need to think about combination reforms if we are looking at individual reforms first and whether or not they're adequate. The second is just the notion of that there was a bailout of money market funds. And, and here, I just have to say that, you know, by the time that the MLF in the United States came out on March 18th, there were actually several central bank programs. Um, including half a trillion dollars in, in, in swap lines to foreign central banks, as well as over $650 billion to the repo markets. And MMLF at the end of the day um, only was about $50 billion. So I think we do have to put everything in context. Thank you. Great, thank you, Eric. Uh, I think the next person, uh, Jing Zhao, has a hand raised. Hello, 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 hello. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I just wanted to make two and short comments. And the first is regarding the compilation of the options. And uh, in our practice, and uh, we believe that compilation of the options capital buffer and the limits on the eligible asset is remarkable. And we think that this compilation can select the money market funds underlying asset and based on quality and that to improve the general fund credit rating and liquidity. And at the same time, and keeping the cash-like caricature of money market funds, that we think that this combination can improve the um, liquidity of the money market funds and will maintain the traditional and the concept of, of the investors regarding the money market funds. Therefore, and we think that this combination and may be a very effective one and uh, maybe the regulator should consider. And the second comment is regarding the um, overall and uh, uh, resilience of the short-term financing market. And we believe that uh, important challenge for the overall resilience of the short-term mar financing market is how to maintain the liquidity and when the market expectations are not so optimistic. And we know that besides the money market funds, there are also mutual funds, insurance companies, security brokerage firms, pension funds, and uh, 
Balabala and as uh, the provider of, of the funds into this market. And uh, I think the regulators should uh, try to increase the proportion of participant and who can provide stable funds and ensure their willingness to provide the funds and uh, into the short term financing market. I think that by widely introducing multiple funding providers into the uh, short term financing market and encourage the investors to deepen their participation in the short term financing market, and uh, we could expand the funding resources of the short term financing market and uh, improve the stability of the whole market. And uh, we don't need just to uh, depend on the money market funds and uh, to provide the liquidity and uh, during the um, bad situations. And it's just um, um, uh, on my um, two points. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you for those remarks. I think next, uh, I understand Adina uh, Arida had your, would like to come in and speak. Yes. Thank you. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Maybe speak a little louder, but I can hear you. Okay. I will try to speak louder. Thank you very much. Um, yes. Thank you for this very interesting workshop. Um, there are so many things to say. I would just like to, to highlight two things. First, um, when the, the European program, the, the pandemic program came, uh, it took some days before being effective. And it is in this period that we had the, the bulk of our redemptions and we have fulfilled them uh, without any need. So we, first, there, there was not a bailout of money market funds. It helped the market. And as soon as our investors, especially corporate, could issue again and on the primary market, they had enough um, uh, liquidity to be able to come back very quickly to money market funds. So first thing to say, this is a holistic issue. Money market funds are one player, but this is a holistic issue. Of course, the confidence in the market is given by the central bank. It is not given by one or the other player. It's given by, by the, uh, the central bank. But in uh, um, uh, the players uh, did have to, to to be resilient, and the the first reform helped them to cope with this potential. So this was the first thing I wanted to say. And the second thing, very important, is that um, uh, money market funds economically play a role uh, in France for I don't know 30 years of matching different interests. The ones of uh, the one who want to fund very cheap and 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 ineffective uh, certificates uh, deposits and commercial papers, especially for the new CPs uh, that are transparent in France, uh, they really think, the, our investors, that this is very important to be able to issue um, this, and, and it is the money market funds that are the financing player for this. And regarding the investors, they also are very interesting in, in money market funds because this is a diversification uh, of counterparty risk. It is uh, an easy tool to use, et cetera, et cetera. So the money market fund matches this interest. So the further reforms should take into account this um, uh, good uh, role played by the money market funds. And if we take our money markets, what will happen? I think we have to wait all this uh, because they, they have proved their resilience uh, through this crisis. Thank you. Great, thank you, Adina. And actually, I, I should mention too, if folks, uh, when you come in, if you wouldn't mind just mentioning your institution or wherever you're affiliated, just so people have a little context for all our different participants today, uh, if you haven't already forgot to mention that. Uh, so next hand up, I see Bob, who I guess has already introduced that. So Bob, please go ahead. From the redemption fee and achieve anything particular that wouldn't be achieved by the elimination of the redemption fee at all. Um, the, uh, the, the firms that sought relief or sought uh, 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 to bail out when they hit 30% didn't do so because they did so because they were unwilling to, to uh, impose a fee or impose a gate because the widespread understanding in the industry that as soon as you do that, you are out of business basically. And so uh, I think the redemption fees have to be rethought as a whole, as opposed to saying, well, you can uh, have a 30%, you can have a redemption liquidity fee, or you can have gates and assume that that's a meaningful part of any 
uh, uh, revision of 2A7 or any regulation in the United States because they simply will not be used. As a matter of business, they, they, they cannot be used uh, as, a, as a practical matter. And that's one of the things that uh, March 2020 taught us. So I don't see any hands immediately up. Uh, just give folks a second. If you'd like to come in, please raise your hand. Oh, I see Paul Tucker. If you'd like to come in, please. Thank you. Um... I thought Eric made some pretty good points, actually, and I, I'm, I'm saying this just um, so that kind of Sarah and Hyun can kind of weigh this. The the kind of problem that the industry side of this debate has, and a kind of point it can make, at least as part of a rhetorical exercise, is kind of what was the Fed trigger happy? Um, and I mean, of course, my I came from an institution whose history was typically to let somebody fail first, most famously in over in Gurney in the 1860s, um, precisely so that people can see what happens and that others can see that they need help. Um, and, and I think that's something the official sector should weigh. Um, I think if I were Eric, what I would be lobbying for would be a law barring the Federal Reserve um, from ever providing facilities to money funds again. And if such a law were passed, I think if I were the Fed or the Treasury, I would be persuading, um, trying to persuade Congress that the law should um, include an emergency waiver clause which would be, which would enable a rescue, but which would um, entail some costs for the authorities, but actually severe costs for those that were rescued. I mean, very severe costs, like being barred from commercial life um, forever. Because I think what, where I agree with Eric is some credible lines have to be drawn that either these things are issuing safe assets and therefore implicitly and therefore should ideally explicitly have the backing of the state or alternatively they are not safe and they are never going to get the backing of the state and everybody understands that but actually what the industry tends to lobby for is the status quo but the status quo is the is the is is, is the position most likely to aggra aggravate the taxpayers um because it ends up with rescues, which the industry will say were unnecessary, and other people will say were necessary, and actually is just um, rich fund managers take the take the profits in the good times, and the poor taxpayers take the losses in the um, bad times. And this isn't to disagree with Eric; it's to encourage people like Eric and um, Tom earlier to kind of think through what strategy do you want, and the strategy you should want, I think. For, you, for yourselves is to put it beyond doubt. There will be no rescues for you and that you will put yourselves on that line. And I think that that's a perfectly reasonable place to be given the beliefs um, that, you, that you present. But I think you should want to agree that where we are is kind of a hopeless um, state of affairs, not just for the efficiency of finance, but for the health of um, of our society. So that's not disagreeing, Eric. It's saying that I think you need to kind of think through what you really want and lobby for it you know, with all the resources at your disposal. Great. Uh, thank you for those comments. I'll just add in there, I think there was some legislation, at least in the US, that attempted to do some of that after the 08 crisis, although uh, we still had some interventions in March 2020, so uh, more food for thought as people consider the, that last exchange. So I understand next uh, that Carrie Evans would like to come in and say. Hello. 
Hi, thank you, Sarah. Can you hear me? So I'm just there struggling to get yeah. off of mute. Um, <laughs> no worries, I can hear you. I was I was double muted, as is the the the, the risk in these days. Um, I, I I just had kind of one observation that I that I think might be a salient consideration here, and that's you know moving aside from some of the post-crisis money market fund reforms, if you look at some of the big pieces of you know big international policy and financial stability post global financial crisis. I think there's two pillars here that are important considerations. One is the increasing need for cash and collateral to move around the system to, to collateralize risk. And the second is bank legislation and bank regulation, prudential regulation that disincentivizes that cash from moving through bank balance sheets. And in a lot of ways, that actually creates a need for a market-based cash solution for a lot of market participants. So my, my observation here is if money market funds, for whatever reason, cease to be attractive to that segment of the market without actually solving those fundamental two-way pushes of a need for intraday cash movement, and the fact that that's not going to realistically come from the banking sector, I, I think there's actually a risk of more moral hazard, not less here when we're talking about central bank interventions. If I look at the patterns of some of the interventions in Europe, in particular from the Bank of England and the ECB, their interventions in CP markets were very much limited to more or less primary issuance to make sure that corporate issuers could keep funding taps open. And if we think of a world where you know money market funds are less viable options for some of these users to manage their intraday cash positions and more of them are turning to the underlying markets directly um you know I, I think a few people have said this before you know the structure of markets are such that in times of crisis they could be prone to break down again without you know significant structural reforms um in a world with a much more disaggregated user base who are probably going to be managing their positions in the underlying investments in a, in a less say liquid way than they currently are done through money market funds. I think there's actually more incentive or sorry, more, more moral hazard rather for central banks to need to step in and, and, and underpin market functioning in these segments than today where a significant chunk of it goes through money market funds. So it's, it's, it's just an observation that I'll leave there. Great, thanks Carrie. And I'll just add, I think uh, the report mentioned the short-term funding market structure as certainly a feature that plays into it. Um, and I'm happy to hear from participants today if they have specific reforms that they think would facilitate that. I know I heard some mentioned earlier, um, but I know that the report also posed some questions as to uh, if you had you know, more transparency or electronic trading platforms and the like, whether that would be enough to enhance resiliency there. So I'll just throw that out there for anyone who's interested in covering that point as well. Uh, Michelle Peco, I understand you have your hand up again, if you'd like to come back in. Yeah, thank you. Uh, maybe one point is we, we tend to forget that it was an external shock uh, due to the pandemic. It was not like in 2008, uh, inherent problems within portfolios. At the time, it was too much risk, uh, too much credit risk, uh, ABSs, structure, uh, structure finance products, these type of things. Now, uh, we had very, very uh, defensive portfolios, uh, high quality assets, and I think it's important to, 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 to keep in mind. The other thing is uh, money market fund have capital, we are talking about what we put, could do, uh, put some kind of guarantees, uh, set up a bank and so forth, but, but shareholders represent the capital of money market funds. And we have 100% of capital in money market funds. The question is, who takes the losses in case of issues? And I think on VINAF funds, from what we've seen during the crisis, we've been able to, uh, to have uh, big impacts 10, 15 basis points, uh, performance impact, and customers, shareholders came back. So it means that they are ready to accept to take some losses in case of a crisis. Uh, and maybe last point linked to a taxpayer or, or, or the, the cost of a central bank intervention. ECB bought 35 billion of uh, commercial papers. They bought it on the primary market mostly, maybe in more than uh, 95%, and it was to help the real economy to find short-term financing. I think we have to be 
beyond that, it was not a bailout of money market fund in Europe. It helped, of course, but no bailout at that time. Great. Thank you, Michael. Uh, next, I see John Donahue, if you would like to come in and add some thoughts. Sure, just uh, quickly a uh, response to uh, both uh, Barclays and Paul Tucker. So just as far as the redemption fees, I do think that if you had a modified redemption fee that was very prescriptive at the board level, uh, that wasn't um, optional but mandatory, it could work. You'd have to think about the bright line issues. But again, you need to decouple that from any other criteria, um, like the 30% WLA and have it um, trigger based. Um, with various events happening in the fund at the point in time. So that's something that, again, we, we have a proposal out. I'm happy to go into greater detail with anybody who wants to hear more about it. And just uh, to, to Paul Tucker's comment about not allowing the Fed to bail out money market funds, I can tell you that from my perspective, that bailout was larger than for money market funds. That bailout was for short-term funding markets. So you could put that policy in place and the spillover from uh, what was happening in March of 2020 would have just exacerbated into ultra short funds or uh, intermediate bond funds. And ultimately, uh, without addressing market structure challenges during times of the liquidity, the Fed or other central banks probably would be compelled to come in uh, to rescue markets, broadly not money market fund bailout. Okay, thank you, John. And uh, Eric Pan, I see your hand up. Not sure if it's a, a new hand or a residual hand, but wanted to give you a chance. Yeah, thank you. So it, it's a new hand. Um, well, I just Great. I feel compelled to to kind of jump back in um, uh, after uh, Paul Tucker's comment. Um, so I, I think you know there are a couple things. One is let's not forget that money market funds, uh, both in Europe and in the United States are highly regulated uh, products. Um, uh, this idea that somehow that this is the Wild West and there's this reckless behavior going on, um, which sort of underlies the kind of the moral hazard narrative is just not true. Uh, uh, money market funds uh, do have to uh, follow a lot of regulated, regulatory requirements, which includes the maintenance of liquid assets and that's the whole focus of the WLA and of course it's a concern when uh, regulation not intended but has an unintended consequence of actually creating an effect which actually exacerbated uh, redemption pressure uh, as was discovered last March in 2020 and so I think that that's why there's a legitimate reason to have a conversation as to well maybe we should remove that unintended consequence but I also was pointing out in my previous comment was, so then let's do that and let's see what would happen. And um, again, based upon simulations, the removal of that tie would have actually allowed prime money market funds, so I'm now focusing on prime, um, to actually be quite resilient, more resilient than I think they're being credit for, credited for. Um, and I think that has to be acknowledged quite closely because uh, to the point of some of the other panelists, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, you 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 need to be, you need to be careful as to um, how you're going to impact the operation of the funds, because there are both positive and negative consequences of any type of, of regulatory intervention, and, you know, if 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 I'm being deemed a lobbyist as a lobbyist, I would say. Have that conversation. I think th these roundtables like this are great because we are hearing perspectives from both sides on this issue. But you need to have that conversation. You need to do that investigation. So then we get to this question of, well, why don't we just say we'll never never need central bank support? Um, and I think it, it's interesting because first, as said before, it kind of is assuming a narrative that there is behavior going on where people assume central bank support is always available. And as a result, um, uh, you know, people are already kind of just relying on the existence of this support. I don't think that's true. Second, the nature of the support that we had back in March 2020, which was an extreme event, um, 
as I noted, was actually part of a much broader set of programs by the central banks um, and was by far not the largest. And as um, John Donahue just pointed out, nor was it just for the benefit of money market funds. It was actually directed at helping out the short-term funding markets. And then finally, of course, is the obvious policy question. You know, uh, this notion of let's never, um, let's have people ex ante kind of disavow the need for any type of future support from a central bank or a finance ministry. Of course, you know, we can talk about all areas of the financial sector um, and whether or not they should be making that that type of ex ante pledge. And, and I think that I'd be very surprised if very members of the, very many members of the FSB would think that's a good idea. Um, you know, it, 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 that strikes me as being a reckless policy decision uh, because why, why, why take away your policy tools, um, uh, you know, in advance when we know that there are actually very good reasons why those tools should be used. I'll stop there. Okay, thanks, uh, Eric. Uh, Paul, I don't know if you wanted to to come in for a second to respond. I saw your hand up. Didn't know if that was a residual hand, but that, wanted to. That's a residual hand. I mean, oh, it's, okay. It's, it's, <laughs> I, I think I think getting Eric onto this kind of ground and Tom onto this kind of ground is the is the key is the key thing. I mean, part of the problem with the debate is that it's conducted in a binary terms that they're either kind of all money market behavior is is conducted again the shadow of moral hazard or alternatively it makes absolutely no difference whatsoever to that behavior but actually there are sunspots and the u.s cavalry turns up and of course it's not like that at all the challenge is how to internalize into the kind of private sector the potential availability of the safety net and the authorities have completely failed to to do that and we can't expect the private sector to even begin to to grapple with that problem because they're doing their jobs rather than the, the kind of broader job. And my worry about your exercise, Sarah, is, which I think is a good exercise, is that like the last one, this will merely be another little ratchet that helps to kind of identify what the um, issues are and for me the issue is is the safety net there and what are the consequences of the safety net potentially being there and as you rightly said sarah that the the march 2020 things for what it's worth eric i think were overdone if it had been me wouldn't have been done in the same way as you heard me say in context of monetary stuff um but there are never any consequences for the borrowers um, however reckless they have they have been, and that my point isn't Eric that you were personally reckless or others were. It's that actually there is never any um, cost for the people who get bailed, and so it, I would say the burden of for the state to be present there as the insurer of last resort, effectively spending resources that can't be spent elsewhere, um, and that's the decisions the presidents and prime ministers and chancellors have to take is a kind of grave one. And the solution somehow has to internalize that this back into finance. And it may well be, and Hintz heard me say this on another occasion, that the whole structure of the dollar short-term funding markets, so the non-financial corporate sector, um, is, is deeply problematic. I think it probably is. I don't think it's nearly as good as the structure of the corporate finance markets um, from around 1850 to around 1950 when sterling was the um, currency because there the people that held the paper and sold on the paper retained some responsibility um, for it whereas whereas now the cp market is some kind of um it kind of looks more efficient than it is is my best guess but you know um i was merely trying to steer you to where i think the tough issue should be and on the final thing if if you're right about fsb members um, Eric, and you may well be right about FSB members. Well, that doesn't mean that, that they are fulfilling the duties of their office by holding those views. Okay, so I think that as we are at uh, time, that's going to have to be the, the last word from our panelists today. I'm going to turn it over to Hune right now to give a few wrap up remarks.
uh, the one, that's me. Um, let me just uh, turn off my camera because I think uh, my bandwidth uh, is suffering somewhat. So uh, please excuse me while I uh, so that uh, this is uh, for the benefit of uh, um, uh, We've heard some uh, some uh, some very good comments. Uh, it uh, won't surprise you that many of these comments also figured in our internal deliberation when we uh, when we undertook this exercise. Um, uh, there were some some issues that uh, arose uh, on central bank operations, uh, the broader functioning of markets, and so on. Um, uh, and I just wanted to assure you that uh, uh, this exercise is, is part of a broader exercise uh, that the FSB is under on non-bank uh, financial intermediaries. Um, and you will see uh, the echoes of some of these uh, these bigger questions in the report. Um, uh, I won't even attempt to uh, summarize your comments or indeed uh, uh, even remotely go to uh, to even um, you know uh, uh, trying to draw some interim conclusions. But what I would say is um, uh, we, we have recognized the the importance of the the. Um, of thinking about resilience of money market funds within the broad context uh, of the functioning of short-term funding markets, uh, I, I think you you can see a, a very strong um, sort of theme throughout the report. Um, but as several of you have noted, uh, when we do see vulnerabilities, uh, I think we do need to address both the uh, the background vulnerabilities, but also um, uh, the workings uh, of the institutions uh, that are that are uh, constituent parts uh, of the market, what the microeconomic incentives are, um, and as Terry um, mentioned at the very beginning of the exercise, uh, you know there are some features of the market which have to do with the with the maturity mismatch uh, and the um, and the different perceptions that uh, you know do pose some very uh, you know deep questions uh, for us. So the exercise is not to point fingers or to you know blame any particular uh, sort of individual set of actors, but rather to try and get at the um, you know the confluence of different forces. Uh, it's better to think of this, I think, more in terms of the externalities rather than any kind of you know um, uh, sort of bad faith on on the part of individual actors. Um, and it's to approach this with very much a, a systemic focus. Um, uh, so I think with that, um, Sarah, I think we've we've had uh, I, th I think we've given you know very good um, you know we've we've aired all the key questions. Um, it's very good to have the uh, the frank discussions that we that we had uh, um, today. Um, rest assured that we have uh, taken very careful notes of all your comments, um, but we uh, would of course. Um, appreciate very much your your written submissions um, to to this call for comment, um, so that we can we can uh, uh, do them justice when we uh, when we think about the uh, the broader feedback. So with that, let me uh, you know, thank all of you. Uh, it was an incredibly well attended workshop. I I didn't expect uh, uh, you know us to sort of top uh, uh, two hundred and fifty, but uh, we. We actually reached fairly close to that. Um, let me thank the secretariat for uh, for their help. And um, um, you know, while you uh, you know while you ponder some of these uh, some of the deeper issues, um, uh, I hope you can you can channel some of your thoughts um, and and give us the benefit of of, of your written remarks um, of your written remarks by the uh, by the August sixteenth uh, deadline. So with that, let me let me conclude. Uh, turn my camera on in case uh, that uh, I can wave my hands. <laughs> uh, the um, thanks so much, everyone, for attending today.